Great, that's pretty interesting. You know, that's one of these things where, where you go, if that is as disruptive as they say it is, it's pretty significant. And then with the backing of a major carrier like Telstra, you go, okay, well, that's you know, worth a second look. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Telesonera and 365, 365 data centers. We've got Kiao Kangdek and Rob Polkonik. Polkonik. Guys, come on up. Thanks. Close one, and you guys can grab those two. All right, perfect. All right, as I said, we're kind of getting into routine. The audience, you guys have probably seen a few more. We kick it off with a carrier kind of talking to Lois about us, and then we roll over to the partner and then talk about the partnership. So, with that, let's start with Rob. All right, uh, thank you all for having us. Um, we're a little bit different between the two companies. Uh, neither one of us is really a startup, um, but we want to talk a little bit more about uh, you know what we've done to, together to enable our clients. Mm -hmm. So, um, for those people in the room that aren't familiar with uh, Telesnr, which I would guess is a lot of you based on the conversations I had earlier today, um, we're a little startup out of Sweden. So we did about 15 billion in sales last year, uh, about 28,000 employees and we've got a market cap of around $30 billion. So our head office is in Stockholm. Uh, we're a result of the merger between uh, Telia and Sonara, uh, so Finland and Sweden, and we're essentially the local exchange carrier over there. We have a massive mobile business. It's uh, primarily in Northern Europe. Um, and that's the basics about the company. So some of the things that we've done as far as innovation uh, and to give you an idea of the size and the scope of the company, so we run the second largest internet backbone in the world. Uh, we're generally ranked number one or number two in the US. Um, and then we were the first ones to ever do 100G uh, uh, networks in both Europe and North America. And you know we do a lot with mobile, which is not really the focus of the international carrier part though. Right. Mm. And you know we were also the first ones to ever launch a 4G service. And then That's right. It was uh, ahead of everyone else, and then the U.S. kind of beat it in scale. But we actually started in Europe with you guys. Yep. yep. First LTE. Yep. And so uh, we run about 200 pops or points of presence uh, worldwide, um, and everything we do in our network is enabled for anywhere from a one gig, ten, a two and a half, ten, or hundred gig connection. So the big pipes that people are going after now, um, we're kind of the leading edge of that. And just to give you an idea, in, in the last year, just in the US, um, we put in over a, a hundred, um, <clears throat> 100 gig ports and about 150 uh, 100 gig waves. A mm. um, little bit more, about 300 data centers uh, worldwide. Everything we do, the entire network, 300 milliseconds or less um, anywhere in the world, basically. Um, IP backbone we talked about. and we quite often get rated very highly for our customer service. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we're kind of doing in the US is we're in a challenger position. And so people that are used to dealing with the large network companies, we tend to be a lot more responsive. And let me jump in too, and so people get an idea of where, like, because your, your speech is coming from where you're coming from. Yep. And so everybody understands your focus, you're not the consumer in the mobile, the Sweden-based uh, telecom provider. Your angle in Telesnare and your role and mandate yep. is this, uh, big, big transport, transit, and uh, you know, big contracts, peering relationship, and things like that. Absolutely. Right. So that's yeah. that's his, your perspective. So yep. that explains kind of where the slides come. So everybody knows you're not talking necessarily about customer service for six one one. You know, my, my phone dropped a call. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's interesting because a lot of people are really familiar with the parent company. Yeah. And so I've had several people approach me today and you know talk to me about what they can do you know f for our mobile service. Yeah. And the only thing I can do with those people is hook them up with the right people in Sweden. Which is pretty good. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so kind of the reach in what we're doing in the U.S., um, we went up about 40% last year in both sales and our points of presence. So we used to have 40, 44 pops, we're up to 62 now. Yep. And you know, we did all that in the last 18 months. So we're being very aggressive with our network in the United States. 100 new customers, most of those are you know, pretty large content customers. And what we're gonna get into a little bit later with uh, KO and 365 is some of those mutual customers and what we've done uh, together to enable them. Yep. Um, 
And this is just a basic overview of our services. What we really concentrate on in the U.S. is the capacity and the IP. And we'll do some of these other solutions and the voice and stuff that we do. It's just really the international roaming part of it. And so that's a little bit about us. Yep. No. You know what, and before we, we'll flip over to Kayo in a second, but what makes that kind of interesting and you as a differentiator, and we have this every year, we have, you know, these uh, IP transit type of uh, speaker, because it's, it's important for people to know that there's different, first of all, there's different kind of telcos. There's some that focus strictly on your areas, there's some that are strictly domestic, local, consumer telcos, yep. and there's a lot of them, the tier ones, that do activities in multiples in both. And while it, a company like Telesonera Consumer would look at an AT&T and go, well, we're completely non-competitive, we, you know, um, yeah, where, where you live, you're in the competitive where you compete against Deutsche Telekom, British Telekom, AT&T every day because you're talking about international transit lines. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is a lot of those carriers, too, is we exchange traffic with them yeah. and we also sell each other you know, circuits within the United States. So if they're out of their primary market, they'll be buying from us. If we're out of our primary market, we'll be buying for them. Yep. So all the big cable companies um, and all the international carriers, you know, we all exchange. Perfect. So now let's, let's roll over to Kayo and I'll hear a little bit about right. what you guys are doing at 365. Great. So uh, uh, at 365, we, we're a, a data center provider. So think of an Equinix, a Corsite, a Telex, uh, except that we operate primarily in what we call tier two markets. So not just the big cities, the big peering cities like Chicago or New York or DC or San Jose, but we love the tier two markets, places like Cleveland, St. Louis, Pittsburgh. And the reason we, uh, we're focused there is because there's so much growth as a lot more content begins to move to the edge. So at a high level, we operate 15 data centers throughout the U.S. Uh, they're all carrier neutral, uh, mostly in tier two markets. And uh, we help companies like content providers or carriers and cloud providers to really move their content closer to end users, right? And the big trends that are driving our growth have to do with um, really what I think is transforming the telecom industry right now and challenging it, which has to do with the growth of data and in particular video. Uh, video is changing the way uh, we're seeing our customers, large carriers, yep. CDNs, uh, Facebook, Google, Netflix. Um, uh, it's changing how they think about distributing content. So case in point, how many of you um, uh, are using, have cut the cord on your cable service, right? And, and how many of your kids watch Netflix and Hulu on a tiny little computer rather than watching the nice new TV that you bought, right? So there are good, there's good reason for that, right? If you look to the right, um, the cost of a streaming service is a fraction of what people normally pay for a single uh, um, unit uh, of, of getting cable TV, right? That's what's driving the big change. And that change has to do fundamentally with hundreds of thousands of cable subscribers, cable TV subscribers, leaving cable TV and just watching t uh, t TV content over the internet, over the top services, right? The, the interesting thing is, and you see how some of these, these carriers and MSOs are impacted. The interesting thing is companies like Comcast, um, although they're losing TV subscribers, are actually becoming more profitable by being able to market in a more targeted fashion over the internet rather than over general TV. So those guys are doing just fine. Now there are a couple of other, other uh, big trends that we see that are driving the market. Not just the creation of uh, content and HBO and everything becoming available, but it also has to do with technology at the edge. And uh, specifically, and some of you uh, may know about this, it has to do with uh, things like Doxis 3.1, which is the new cable modem technology that's being rolled out. That's going to bring uh, uh, one gig to the home for subscribers, right? That's a big jump from 18 to 30 megs of usage through your, your internet and that jumping up to a gig to your home. So we see these two big things happening, right? One is an unprecedented amount of content being created. Yep. Video content. And on the other side, 
small cell DAS, increase in download speeds to edge devices, and bandwidth to the home that will increase by 30x. What that's doing is putting a pressure on the internet like it's never felt. So it's causing companies, we call them frankly new carriers, um, like a Facebook or, or an Apple, that are building their own networks, right? Because they can and buying dark or, or big 100 gig waves. Yep. And you can see it in the numbers, right? The, the, uh, the internet was not built to support the type of video growth that we have. So that's where we're focused and why we believe that the tier two markets are gonna be a part of the answer to delivering more and more content reliably so you don't get the little buffering thing on your phone while you're trying to watch a video or a small snippet that you have to watch right right then. Um, and, and that brings us to our uh, partnership. We forgot to get rid of that animation, so I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, but uh, it's pretty exciting. You know, what, what, what we have thought of as things that are just typical of um, the telecom industry and tier one markets like New York or New Jersey or, or San Jose, big carrier neutral data centers, internet peering, and rich big pipes going in and out of them, uh, that's what we're working with Telecinera on, on bringing to tier two markets. So in, in the one thing that we've seen with our customers and the biggest content customers, you know, the, the Netflix, um, you know, the Facebook, yeah. those guys, they used to use a lot of CDN to deliver their content, but at some point they run into two things. A, it gets cost prohibitive yeah. uh, when they get to a certain scale. And so what a lot of them are doing now is they're building out, so they have their massive data centers. So I'll give Facebook as an example, and this is all public. So they have a data center in Prineville, Oregon. It's a million square feet. So these things are massive, and they have um, three other ones in the United States, and another one, which is where Telia got involved with them, because they have one in Lulia, Sweden, which is 60 miles south of the Arctic Circle, if anybody wants to visit. <laughs> but um, so those guys, instead of doing their CDNs, they're actually building out that content at the edges. So now they need these t tier two market data centers. Yep. And we found that when we work with them and then we get companies like 365, you know, it's a good partnership to bring that large amount of content out to the edge without having to utilize a CDN. Well, so, so explain to me the, the difference then. So how is a CDN different than a data center that's distributed? Yeah, so um, CDNs are our customers, Com companies like Akamai and Limelight. Right. You know, they're, uh, as I like to say, the cloud needs to live somewhere, so it might as well live in our data center. Yep. Yeah. So companies like Akamai and Limelight, uh, they have these massive server farms, they deploy them in a data center. So that's what we provide. We don't compete with them. Now, what we're seeing is a, is a pretty broad trend across a lot of different sectors of telecom is the, the content distribution companies yep. and content delivery companies, streaming media companies, are rethinking the way that they distribute data right. and really thinking about doubling their footprint because you can no longer uh, serve content out of the peering yeah. cities, right? So, but that sounds like a CDN versus the, the, what the structure you guys are talking about is really more of a business change. Like it's shifting from a Akamai uh, buffered and automated hosted area of maybe your data center to a Netflix uh, rented and leased uh, area of the same data center, but Netflix has more direct control and you know, right. arranges the business terms directly. Cool. Yeah, it's really both of them mm -hmm. because you're seeing those largest companies, they can afford to do that and yeah. they can afford to build out that infrastructure and they have been doing it for the last mm -hmm. few years. Yeah. Um, but those companies that aren't quite to that scale, um, they're going to have, their CDNs are going to perform better right. when they get closer out to the edge. Yeah. Right. And so, and if you like the, uh, like the, the choice of all these secondary markets is obviously interesting. Is it uh, a gap in the marketplace and that, uh, that hasn't been addressed by the tier one U.S. carriers in this map, at least U.S., thus far, uh, uh, that, that they're going to get to, but they're iteratively working their way down? Or is it just something that they weren't attracted to right now? Well, there, there, there are a couple of drivers. You know, initially we thought sort of notionally, oh, wow, content needs to move to these other cities to reduce latency, Yep. right? But what it came down to was, was really when you're serving video at scale, yep. right, uh, at a couple of megs to 15 megs per right. second if you're streaming 4K video, you run into all sorts of buffering problems, yeah. video starts, and, and I would say the, 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 the content providers 
are now trying to figure out how to keep up with the rollout of small cell DAS yeah. and the rollout of DOCSIS. Because as soon as you do that, whether they like it or not, if you don't have the infrastructure in place or the network topology and architecture, yeah. then you're not going to serve your content. I think when we first heard about CDNs like many years back you know, with that combined stuff, the notion was latency reduction. Yep. Whereas, but if you consider like the, the concept of I got a single server hosted in San Francisco, and I'm, I'm serving a, you know, a multi a multiplayer game, have a user in New Jersey and a user in San Francisco, you're really not transmitting massive amounts of data, but you need low latency. So, yep. um, but if we're talking about a HD movie, now all of a sudden the, the size of the, the cargo starts to really matter and the yep. costs of that cargo go up, right? So now it's really an economic factor that's right. telling me to go local as opposed to a latency or performance factor. Right. I mean, right. obviously latency performance well, as well. Well, I, I think we all remember, you know, people in this, in this room were part of the, the, the mid-90s, right, when the internet awesome really times. started growing, yep. right? And the internet was not built to do big video. It was built for basic websites, information, media. Yep. Akamai came out, made it a little bit easier to right. get that. Right, my Netscape content. browser, you know, assembled the page a little more quickly. <laughs> right. You get but to all watch of a it sudden now, yeah. you're talking about how do you get a 15 meg stream to every wireless device and serve a gig to the home. It's the internet was was not built to do it. And and I always like this, you know, this this picture because it shows how absurd the telecom industry has become in terms of still the major peering points only exist on the periphery of the US, mm -hmm. you know, driven by where landing stations were right. and where the initial connections were. The reality is what the future of telecom is going to be really driven by the content providers that are going to dictate. So it's this legacy go. notion of, okay, British telecoms wires are landing on that side of right. the country, right. so the U.S. carriers will peer there. And you're saying what's going on is more, you know, where does Netflix peer and things like that? And YouTube yep. and things. Exactly. This data center. Where was it, what, the one you talked about, the Facebook data center? Uh, the one in Sweden. Or, no, oh, there's another one in Prineville, Oregon. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was in Oregon, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's talk partnership quick, and we have a you know, very a little bit amount of time left. So, you know, by the way, we're not our goal isn't just to talk about startup with telecom. It's really it's about partnering. You know, so it's, it's large companies and established companies. But tell me a bit about how long has 365 been in existence? First of all, so how many? right. So we acquired uh, these data centers uh, about three years ago. Yep. And uh, they were we acquired them from Equinix. Um, so we've been around for a while. The data centers have been operational for. 13 plus years. And so at a very high level, what does the partnership bring to you? So for us, it's pretty transformational for our customers, right? Yep. So we're, we're trying to go after the largest content providers. Yep. So our ability to go to them and say, hey, you know, you want to move to St. Louis, you want to move to Nashville, yeah. you're going to be able to get a 100 gig wave out of there to interconnect to your other network, right? right? To your larger mega data centers yeah. as well as to our other data so centers. So you can explain the, a turnkey solution to them versus just, you know, well, here's a data center, figure out the transit yourself. You can right. bring them. And, and similarly, you know, what do they bring to you? So we're a very small, flat organization in the U.S. You know, we have 28,000 employees. There are 40 of us in the U.S. Yep. And so we've built this backbone in what when we build into their data centers, we go in there with gear that will handle everything. So we don't just come in and say, hey, we can give you some small IP pipes here. Mm -hmm. But we also, you know, they'll share with us their customer list and stuff. So we can grow our business after we've committed to get into their data centers to, you know, enable their right. important customers. So it's basically synergies, synergies yeah. in terms of bringing it's totally bringing complimentary leads products. Yep. It really is. And, and our large customers, they, they want that, right? They yep. want to know, oh, you know, how can we expand? No, I'm going to guess it's not exclusive, but is it? Like, oh, no. no. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, no, it's, it's, they're carrier it's, neutral, yep. uh, but it's just a question of how well you work with them, too. Yeah. Right? And how you can enable their customers. You know, I'm sure people in this room know, you know, telcos aren't exactly known for being the most customer friendly at times. Yep. Um, but we've through, heard that they're working on it through, through the day. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, you, you look at everybody's presentations earlier today, and almost everybody said, we're working on customer service. Yep. And I think, you know, from a partnership perspective, they're, they're, I've been in the telecom industry, all sorts of different size companies. But, but I think one thing that's made our partnership work yeah. is just the people. It's, it's easier. We try to just be pretty straightforward and make so, things work. So I want, I want to hear a bit about that. I'm out of time, so let's, let's take a minute regardless. So how did you meet them and engage with their people? Uh, we met, I, I met some of the guys at uh, good old PTC, yep. right? With the Mai Tai and, a, and yep. Aloha shirt. <laughs> 
So that sort of helped. Like and um, uh, but over over the years, it's really just turned into a, a much more uh, collaborative, real time yep. partnership. So you, you met with them first at PTC in, in Honolulu, mm -hmm. and um, made sense to was it kind of like oh let's do let's kind of we could co market together is that kind of how it started I mean it's it's not it's it's a pretty it's not a deep technical relationship no, right it's no. just a co marketing relationship yeah. so was it pretty simple to set up uh, it was and, and and part of it just had to do with aligning right so yeah. much of it has to do with aligning with the right people yeah so. Very good. Similar. Yeah, I've been in a lot of different business development, channel development roles. Yeah. And it really comes down to implementing because you'll see so many people, they, you know, sign up as like, okay, this group is going to work with this group. And then it fades after that. Yep. And we're both small enough and agile enough that that continue, you know, we continue to work well together. Yep. And so once you've seen the success, it just builds on itself. I think there's also a big difference from my perspective on you know, many carriers will try to build in incrementally into a data center, yep. right? What we like about uh, Telecinera is they'll go in and bring in these big eight terabit systems yep. and, and, and just bring it in and, and go, right? right? Similarly, if we need to build new vaults coming into the facility, I think there's just more of a willingness to try to really go after that, that market. So. so, Rob, in closing, uh, you guys, you obviously have, you have this relationship with 365. You're looking for any other kind, similar kind of companies that could bring that, obviously drive traffic for your core business. And you, sure. Is that, is that kind of what you're out looking for these days? Yeah, so we're looking at, we're, you know, we're big pipe guys. So anybody who has a lot of content, a lot of video, um, those are really the companies that we're looking for. Yep. Um, but then the parent company who, you know, they have a lot of mobile and they have a lot of other things right. that would benefit from a lot of people in this room. And what I can do is I can facilitate those relationships, but yep. those are a little bit different than what you know we're doing here in the states. Right. Okay. I think I think we got everybody else changed their role. So there's a your main thing is for those big uh, those big data movers. Yep. And, well, and that's that's your. We're all about big pipes. Excellent. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a lot, gentlemen. All right. Thanks, Thank thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. All right. Next up, we're gonna get a lot of carriers all at once and have a.